The following is a public affairs presentation of AM 1220 WQUN. The opinions expressed on the following program do not reflect the opinions of the staff or management of WQUN or those of Quinnipiac University. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Reporter at Large. I'm your host, John DeAndre, and with me this morning is Rich Burgess, president of Connecticut Carry. We're going to be talking about guns, uh, gun control, and uh, the right to own a gun. Good morning, Rich. Good morning. First uh, question out of the box this morning, Governor Malloy's announcement in executive order uh, back in December to deny gun permits to those on federal watch lists did not rub your organization too well, correct? No, it definitely did not. What's the problem with that? There's a lot of problems with it. The primary problem with it is due process. We believe, and so did our founding fathers, that every human has the right to due process under the law. Uh, you, you can't just take away somebody's God-given or, or natural rights or however you want to put it. You can't take away their rights based on something like you know, a, a secret government watch list. And I think most Americans can share in that concern and and probably get on our side about this, whether they like guns or not. That day that announcement was made, it made not only state headlines, but it made national news. Sure. It's a a huge issue and and certainly one that President Obama has been pushing quite a bit. Um, The the idea that you can take away somebody's rights on a a watch list, it's also a, a case that the ACLU has really been pushing for too, which... They're not usually our allies on on armed self-defense type of stories, and yet they're still very much on our side about this. So I, I think that's, a, a again, an a area where we can all cross lines and really share in a concern. Right. So this is, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows here. Your organization's issue with this is what? Well, it's it's really the due process of, of taking away rights from people, and I think really that's the shared goal of the ACLU even though they don't necessarily like firearms, we're really coming under that common banner. And honestly, I think we have a lot more common territory too as well because we really support all of our natural rights, not just guns. Have you or anyone else from the organization Connecticut Carry approached the governor on this? We haven't approached him directly. He doesn't exactly like to talk to us very much. Um, however, we have issued a press release on the situation. We've We've essentially explained our, our side of the issue. We've explained what we'll do about the situation. And we've also explained why he will fall flat on this issue. And what are some of the reasons why he'll fall flat on the issue? Well, the, the due process problem is, is really the primary one. However, the, the secondary one is the idea that he's going to try to do this under executive action. Executive actions are not meant to, to modify laws. This is something that has to go through the legislature. And, and we're pretty confident he's going to end up having to do that in general. But if he takes executive action on this, it would be one of the broadest oversteps of of power that a a governor in Connecticut has ever performed. Why do you think he's doing this? I think he's doing this to curry favor with President Obama and to further his political career. In terms of uh, the watch list, are there other states in the country that are actually doing this or proposing this? I haven't heard of another state that's proposing to do this, but I try to keep my issues mostly at home in Connecticut. I do know that President Obama talked about it and was probably roundly criticized by his uh, his um, legal representation, I would say. In terms of the State of the Union uh, this month, earlier this month, Governor Malloy was in attendance. What were you thinking about that? I, I thought it was pretty odd, but I think it's, again, along the same path line of, well, we have our favorite political puppet in Connecticut that we can use and abuse and and who cares really what his career does as long as we just keep giving him political favors for infringing on our rights. He's been, in his two terms, on gun control, gun control, right from the very beginning. Sure. Uh, both Malloy and, and Obama have both spent quite a bit of effort on gun control. The, the interesting part for Malloy and for Obama, actually, is that they both share a, a common failure in this area. They both have been the, the Democrat presidents that have done, well, presidents and governors, that have done the least as as far as actually passing gun control. 
And instead, what they've done is is really just anger the population. Why do you think there's such a rift, and why do you think this issue causes such anger with the population? I mean, in every state, it's not just Connecticut. Well, I think people have the natural tendency to believe that they have the right to defend themselves and their families. I think that's an inborn thing. It's a natural instinct. And, you know, I think when you when you tell a mother that she can't protect her dying son from a bunch of thugs that are, are trying to rob her, you know, I, I think that's that's definitely something that gets people's uh, the hair on their back to stand up. Now, Governor Malloy's uh, 2013 gun ban, that was a big to do. That got a lot of attention. What is its status here in 2016? Well, the, the interesting part about the ban is that it, it has not been enforced, really. Um, it never really was, and neither were any of the other laws in this state. But the, the interesting aspects of it are that we, we have a, a law that was aimed to cause cost millions of dollars, and yet you don't hear any of that talk right now when we hear tons of talk about the deficit in this state. We, we have all this money being spent on uh, a non-issue, essentially, that's not going to help anybody. And we have uh, Governor Malloy going on and talking about how crime is at, a lo- at the lowest point in Connecticut in 46 years. Well, if, if the crime rate has been dropping in 46 years, why did we implement this ban? Why are we spending all this money? And how on earth can a, a ban that happened in 2013 affect our crime rate for the last 46 years? Do you know offhand parts of the gun ban that aren't being enforced? Did I hear you correctly say some of them are not being enforced? Sure. Uh, the the ban calls for, you know, it, it would logically, the ban would logically call for the confiscation of firearms if you hadn't registered them. That was kind of the whole point of it is to get these guns off the street. That's a, exactly what they said it would do. Well, they can't possibly do that at this point because of the fact that that you can't just go around rounding up firearms from people. And so the, the whole idea that it gets guns off the street or it takes them away from anybody is, is silly. It, it All it does is restrict people from buying the things they need. What about those uh, gun buyback programs, get a gift card, turn a gun in? Um, do those work? Are those effective? Should we even be doing those? Well, I, I would definitely say not. The, the idea that we're buying guns back, well, it kind of implies that you sold them to them in the first place. So it's a, a weird terminology but the, the idea that we're going out and trying to get guns away from people that need them is also a very worrisome thing. What you're telling the, the inner city populations where most of these gun buybacks happen is, hey, these are just dangerous to have instead of you can defend yourself. A much better idea would be to take that money and spend it on training these people on how to use the firearms and maintain them. Well, you're right. We don't see the suburban towns in greater New Haven having uh, gun buyback programs. It's usually just New Haven, maybe even Hamden. I've never seen one in Greenwich. (laughs) What was uh, one part, if at all, any part of the 2013 gun ban that maybe your organization, Connecticut Carry, was in line with the governor on? Were there any parts to it? No, um, not not in the terms of the gun ban itself. However, there were parts of the law that where they started talking about mental health, where we could have probably tried to ally with the governor on. However, most of the the actual laws that ended up being passed on that in terms of mental health, I think, fell into a, a very strange territory where they instead tried to make it um, criminal activity, or or at least you would be treated like a criminal if you went and got voluntary help for a criminal active, or I'm um, I'm sorry for mental health. That's that's very worrisome, and we have a couple cases right now pending in Connecticut where where people have gone to seek voluntary help for mental health issues, and they're being treated like they're a felon. That's interesting. In terms of the 2013 gun ban on the upcoming legislature, you think there'll be some uh, laws that will either beef it up or change it in any way? Are you aware of any? I doubt it. Um, they, the fact of the matter is with the 2013 gun ban is that they had to do that as an emergency initiative they, they couldn't even pass it through the regular legislative session. So I don't really think the, the popularity of these laws is, is what they say. They, they really don't go well in polls. Most of the polls go way heavily on our side. So I, I tend to think they'll try to leave that alone. Um, I think they have a, a couple issues that they'll probably take up. Like I said, they'll probably try again with the, uh, the secret watch list to try to ban people, which is a very slippery slope. They did that last session as well with the domestic violence stuff where – they tried to make it so that anybody with a one-party report on a temporary restraining order would lose their rights to own a firearm. And so I, I can see them continuing to push that through the various channels, which is really all the, the no-fly lists and watch lists are. So we have a gun 
ban that is basically a showboater? I would say so. It, it really, all it does is go after aesthetic uh, complements of a firearm anyway. It doesn't go after anything that's any more dangerous. There's nothing that it does to, to create a safe atmosphere. All it does is, you know, try to look good to everybody. They, they can call them assault weapons. They have the populace confused that they're somehow machine guns, which they're not. They have a lot of uh, scary terms that they use, but really all it is is just flash and smoke. You're listening to Reporter at Large on AM 1220 WQUN. Good morning. I'm your host, John DeAndre. With me this morning is Rich Burgess, president of Connecticut Carry. We'll continue our conversation in a moment, but first this programming note. Connecticut Radio Network's Dialogue 2016 follows this morning's Reporter at Large. As we continue our conversation, Rich, let's talk about Connecticut Carry, the organization itself. What's it all about in terms of membership? Uh, how long has it been around, and where are you going with it? Connecticut Carry has been around since about 2011. Uh, we formulated after I was actually arrested for open carry, so we kind of formed on the back of the open carry issue. Uh, we Really, the, the idea behind Connecticut Carry was we wanted to be able to help defend and, and protect the people and also to educate them as well. Um, so we, we formed under a, a kind of a large umbrella, and really we've, we've just been working to try to live up to that uh, first of founding principles. Um, at this point, we have about 2,500 members. I believe maybe it's approaching 2,600 now. Uh, we ballooned up after the Newtown incident. Um, you know, we, we really uh, we've, we've had very good luck with people. And I think our, our reputation precedes itself. So who are the members? A bunch of hunters that like to carry guns? Um, I, I would say that we have a, a great emphasis on quality over quantity. Um, we have a, a small but very active group that really likes the idea of armed self-defense. We, we try to really go for the people who, who want to defend themselves and their families and are very serious about it. So if I wanted to join Connecticut Carry and actually carry a uh, handgun, what is the process? Is it a lengthy one? Well, joining Connecticut Carry is free and simple. You go right onto our site and click the Join button. It's free. You, all you do is enter a few basic details about yourself. Of course, we want your email address so that we can contact you with, with great things that we, we talk about. I think they're great. Um, but as far as actually carrying a firearm in the state of Connecticut, you do need a, a Connecticut pistol permit. Um, it's a permit to carry pistols and revolvers, technically. Um, and so that, that permit process can be a little bit arduous. Uh, that's certainly one of the, the services we offer is trying to guide you through that process. Um, and it costs probably in the neighborhood of 350 to $400. But that doesn't mean that you're going to carry a gun. You have to go through, I would imagine, a psychological exam? No, there's no psychological exam. The, the actual p pistol permit in the state of Connecticut is uh, you, you have to go through a training course which is actually with the NRA. It's, it's an NRA authorized training course anyway. We have representatives around the state that can help you. And then the, the actual permit process is really just a suitability test and, and a criminal background check through the, the local town. And then they kind of do the exact same copycat thing through the state. So you have all your, your background checks and all that good stuff. However, the pistol permit is also required, or at least some form of it. We have an ammunition certificate. We have a long gun eligibility certificate. So you really need a certificate to do pretty much anything with firearms in the state of Connecticut. What sort of folk are involved in Connecticut carry? Um, I would like to say we're good folk. Um, we, we have uh, great people helping out. We have a lot of very professional, uh, what you'd call white collar people. We have uh, people who are in the marketing industries, uh, industrial areas, a lot of engineers, a lot of computer programmers, things like that. Um, just really good people that want to try to help out other people. No offense to the New Haven Raccoon Club, but it's not a raccoon club. It's a serious special uh, interest group, correct? Yeah, uh, I haven't been down there in, in recent days, but, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're all good people. We have lots of great gun clubs all around the state. They do amazing things, and you really got to attend some of their meetings to find out all about how what the great performances that they offer. But Connecticut Carry itself is not one of those kind of groups. It's more of a special interest, set the agenda, go for a group, correct? Exactly. Like like I was talking about with the principles that we were founded under, it's it's really a, a part of we want to try to make sure that people are defended. So we, we've seen a lot of cases where people were railroaded for firearms and, 
and things that they did with firearms that necess weren't necessarily violent crimes. They were just simply things that maybe they made a mistake or maybe they were misinterpreted by other people. And so we want to make sure that, you know, those people are defended and have at least resources to be, um, to, to get a fair day in court. Now, some of the benchmark cases or situations and downright crimes in Connecticut, heinous crimes in Connecticut, the Patel case, the Pettit case, and what happened in Newtown, these were violent, violent crimes done by people that were not of right mind. Correct. And if I've understood you in the last few years that I've known you, that there's some misperception or misconception that people that are carrying guns are the ones that need to be controlled. Right. Am I right? I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, we for some reason, we're targeting the wrong group of people. Uh, for instance, in the Newtown situation, we had a, a man who was very mentally ill, apparently. I mean, who would do something like that without being very mentally ill? Um, and I'm no expert to try to call what kind of mental illness he had, but I certainly would have rather he would a, was able to find his health care and, and to get out there and, and be helped because I'm, I'm sure we could have helped this person or at least segregated them from society if we knew that they were really unhelp, you know, beyond help. But we, we really need to concentrate on, on other things too. Like in the, the Patel case, we, we have a situation where a, a person broke into a house, robbed somebody, and his mother had to spend 10 minutes on the phone with state police waiting for them to get there. And she actually proclaims at one point, I'm unarmed and I can't defend myself. And she's worried about these people still being in her house because she doesn't really know if they've left or not. And that's really what Connecticut Kerry wants to get into. Uh, and also in the P Pettit case, you know, he was unarmed. He, he didn't have the means to defend himself. He has since said that he probably would have if he could have. And we really don't want to see another helpless victim be hurt or murdered by a crazy person or just somebody who's evil. We, we want people to be able to defend themselves. Do you think Governor Malloy and people like uh, President Obama actually see that, what you just said? I don't know what is in the heart of other men. Um, I, I certainly think they should be able to see. I, I don't think that these are stupid people. I, I believe that they just don't care. I, I think that they have their own political agendas, and it doesn't involve helping anybody in this state. In the cases we just talked about, uh, they basically deal with psychiatric illness and drug abuse. That's correct, and, and possibly mixing of both. We, we don't really know in many of these situations. Um, it's very hard to get that information out. We have a, a great legal director, uh, Ed Peruta, who's working right now up in, in the Patel case to try to publicize that case so that people can actually see inside the courtroom because when you actually get to the core of these cases, you find out that many of the situations are, are remarkable. In, in the Patel case, for instance, you have a... a convicted felon with a handgun. He had obtained the handgun illegally. And here he is going and trying to to rob a, a known drug dealer for his money. He ends up murdering him. He's also been widely known as a heroin addict. In fact, he's in the town, just one town south of me for all this time. And he was let out of prison. And so now we have Governor Malloy talking about how he's allowing all these, I, I guess it's about 40% of the prison population out I think that's really remarkable that that's his emphasis is we want to get people out of prison, but we want to disarm the people who are good that weren't in prison. That's scary. In our final moments uh, this morning, I'd like to end with uh, the thoughts on the right to arm self-defense. Correct. That's that's really what we champion is the right to arm self-defense. We don't want to talk about, you know, whether it's in the Constitution or not. Certainly it is. Certainly one of our slogans is is the Connecticut Constitution. Every citizen has the right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state. That's what we believe. We think that's really where it stops. You have the right to be armed, and we want you to be able to be armed, but we also want you to have the proper education and things like that. We just don't want the government to mandate it. So here we are to help you, and come see us. Check out our site at ctcarry.com, and take a good look at it and, and try to see what resources you can get out of our site and get in contact with us if you have any questions. And the website address again? C-T-C-A-R-R-Y C -A -R -R -Y dot com. And you'll have someone from your organization bird-dogging the legislation up at the Capitol for 2016? We always do. Rich Burgess, President, Connecticut Carry. Thank you for being my guest. I'm Reporter at Large. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me.
This is John DeAndre. Join us again next Saturday morning for another edition of Reporter at Large. This is AM 1220 WQUN, Hamden, another service of Quinnipiac University.